Well, thank you. You may be seated. And I'm glad you are here today. It is a super Sunday, not because of some football game, but because God is awesome. And Jesus is our Lord and Savior and is coming again to receive us unto himself. He's preparing a place for us. And between now and then, we're worshiping him and becoming more like him. Amen? Let me say it to myself. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Thank you. What a great week it's been. We did have our town meeting last week. If you got the email about affirming our budget, please respond to that as soon as you can, if you haven't already. It was a great uh, chili cook-off. have pictures of just a great crowd that we had. And, um, you know, I... I uh, mentioning that I came in third place in the chili cook-off, and, uh, and then I found out the other night, second place, I won't say who it was, in case you didn't remember, said, well, Pastor Bob, uh, I used your salsa in my chili, so I'm, I'm really a <laughs> second and a half place, I think, haven't talked to the first place person yet, so I might move my way up on the, um, on the scale there, but it's, you know, you know, it's such a great time to fellowship in the Lord. People say, oh, you Christians, you don't, you don't have any joy. Well, shame on the world and shame on us if we don't exhibit that because of who Christ is in our lives. And the ladies, they had their uh, soup uh, and sandwich time yesterday, just uh, seeing all the women here. You know, I was going to study at home, and then Jenny told me the menu, so I thought, I'll just go to my office to, uh, yesterday and study, which was good. So I took a picture of their, uh, I think... Uh, I don't know, man. I think they have the taste test down there, so uh, they did a good job with, with all their soups. And so, well, that picture was supposed to be there. Um, but I did have one picture uh, about the Super Bowl that was very interesting to me, and they were comparing, in case you didn't know who's playing, but it was the San Francisco 49ers with the 1998 Denver Broncos who won the Super Bowl that year. And it's really tough to see, but we'll just start in the upper left. The coach at the time was Mike Shanahan of the Denver Broncos, his son is coaching the San Francisco 49ers. Ed McCaffrey was, uh, um, he was a, run, a run, wide receiver on that team, and his son, Christian McCaffrey, is just one of the best running backs in the NFL on 49ers. Um, Brian Greasy was the quarterback, and now he's the quarterback coach for the 49ers. And Anthony Lynn was uh, running back, and now on the 49ers, he coaches the running backs. And I just, I just love those kind of connections. In fact, they showed a picture of Christian McCaffrey as a little kid when his dad won the Super Bowl just running on the field. You know, the players' kids come and run on the field. Now, I, I showed that chart, not to say, really, it doesn't matter to me who really wins, but the connections, the generations, the experiences God gives us, and we put it together to then see, oh, I, I didn't realize these kind of things were happening. Did, did you all realize that those relationships were there? I looked at that and thought, this is very interesting. Well, that's a great segue as we look at the book of Revelation in terms of God from beginning to end of Scripture showing us, opening up to us what he's doing between now and the end times. And as we see it, to apply those truths to us, and uh, if you're new here, and I, I should probably read it every week, but in the very first chapter, verse 3 of Revelation, that we read that blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. We often say, well, the time is near. Well, what are we doing about it? Are we reading? Are we hearing? Are we then keeping those things that God is showing us? Well, we're in a series called The Voices of Victory, Re Revelation chapter 14. It's the kind of the interval time here in the Great Tribulation, three and a half years, and then an interval, and then three and a half years, which is called the Great Tribulation, the appearance of the Antichrist and the false prophet. And so we've looked at in the first, in the first part of the chapter the voice of salvation. Last week, the voice of condemnation as we talked about Babylon, that city which we read about in Genesis and really is the... Um, the spirit of the world that, that, that will come under condemnation. And today, I'm calling it the voice of determination. Determination in, in an indiv individual way, and where do you determine your faith lies? It's so fitting that we're having a baptism at the end of the service because the baptism in the Christian faith, the command of Jesus to be baptized because he's forgiven our sins and we're repenting of those sins, you will hear me say, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in a new way of life. If you don't hear anything else today as we look at the end times, do you know 
that you have eternal life? Have you come to the point that you are born again? Have you been baptized? I really believe it's the first step of obedience because he says to repent of your sin, asking for forgiveness, and be baptized. It is a profession, the profession of faith. So I want you to be thinking about that as we look at, in the context, Revelation 14 and the voice of determination from the third angel. In studying Revelation 14, we hear the first angel summon mankind to fear and honor God alone. He is the creator and deserves worship. The second angel anticipates events later in the book, proclaims the fall of Babylon, the evil world system of the beast and his false doctrine, false teaching, corrupt practices. And we talked about this last week, that the spirit of Antichrist, Jesus said that, is already here. There is false teaching. There is false doctrine. There are corrupt practices. Now we see a third angel warning those who have decided to follow and worship the beast Antichrist, and go away from God. As a result, this is a sobering line, God will pour out his undiluted wrath on a rebellious world. Revelation 14, beginning in verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, I already mentioned the first two, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Our time frame, as we see this third angel again, is in the middle of what we call the tribulation, seven years, prophesied by Daniel. We see John, and we've been taking several weeks, gosh, it's been over a year now, because of different things that happened during the year, not every week, but looking at the rapture of the church, as God will come for his bride, Jesus will come for his bride, he's the bridegroom that will be raptured, returns for his church, the tribulation beginning, and then when the Antichrist appears, there'll be the abomination of desolation, where he will defame the, deface the temple, and then the last three and a half years before the second coming of Christ, tragedy and disaster, heartache and suffering. As we look at this third angel, and again, chapter 14 is really a a foreshadowing of things that are to come. I talked about that before. We are connecting the dots, if you will, of the angel saying, preaching the gospel to everyone who will hear, God is creator, come to salvation in him. Babylon is fallen, meaning that the world system is gone, and now we see on an individual basis the judgment of God. So let's talk about then, and we can say, well, this is all future tense. Well, If we pass before all this happens, we will stand before God and we will be held to account on our determination, the voice of determination. And is it victorious or is it disastrous? Let's look at our personal submission, point number one. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, receives his mark on his forehead, or on his hand. Let's talk about worshipful devotion. We are, have a focus in terms of what is most important to us, and here, we saw it in Revelation 13, we're introduced to the beast, the Antichrist. His name means exactly the things of Jesus and lordship of Jesus. He is against and stands for all those things against, and we see here in Revelation 14 that there are those who devote their worship to him. He's the king of Satan's final kingdom, his false prophet, which is also a beast, we saw in Revelation 13. He's the religious leader who convinces people to worship him, and it is a part of their devotion, and I feel a part of devotion today of those who don't want to have anything to do with God or his son Jesus. They may not specifically say, I'm worshiping Satan, and he is the dragon here in Revelation 13, and even that is deceptive in that the dragon and the Antichrist, and the false prophet, are a deception in terms of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's an evil trinity versus the trinity we know according to the Scriptures. Look at Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, the Bible says, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
This devotion comes about, there's only two, really, two devotions, ultimately. You're following God or you're following Satan. So many people talk about the gray area. Well, it's just a matter of what you believe and if you sincerely believe. But the Scriptures teach that the judgment of God will come upon those that are not written in the book of life. How do you get written in the book of life? Well, it's putting your faith in the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And here in Revelation 14, we see, the third angel said, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark. He's talking about being devoted to the things against God and the one who is against God, the Antichrist. It's the work of deception. I've already said that. Revelation 13, we go on, 14 and 15. And he deceives, he's now talking about the false prophet, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. A lot here to unpack, and we've already talked about this somewhat, but to know that Antichrist, there's the, he looks like he's dead, comes back to life. The false prophet makes this image. We're not sure what the image is, whether it's a statue or now in technology sense, maybe it's a hologram. But there's this image that then the false prophet deceives folks to then worship this beast, this antichrist who was wounded by the sword and lived. There's these miracles that happen that draw people in to say, ah, this is the true God. Now, do you see the deception as well? What's the story of Jesus Christ? The only begotten Son of God, miraculous birth through the Virgin Mary, lives a perfect life, died for our sins, and then what? Rose again. Do do you see the comparison here? Well, that story is really not good enough. I'm going to worship the Antichrist because that same thing happened to him, and it sounds like a better story. What? That's the choice. That's that worshipful devotion, this work of deception. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. As we talk about the judgment, there is death and destruction at this time for those who don't follow the Antichrist. But as the scripture tells us, no, don't don't fear those who can kill your body. You fear the one who can send your body and soul to hell. God himself. So we see this work of deception. And then finally, the willful distinction. And this is where we get into uh, the mark of the beast. So Revelation 13, 16, 17, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand, on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or name of the beast or the number of his name. Well, if you read and read and read, which I do and I study, it's everything from, is it a chip? Is it a tattoo? Is it the uh, little uh, uh, barcode that only allows you to buy and sell? But, But hear this very clearly, that the image, taking the image, is the one who now worships the beast, excuse me, taking the mark is the one who's chosen this worshipful devotion to worship the beast, and I say that because Christians would say, oh gosh, could, could I do that accidentally? Because I, I, I worry about my buying and selling. This is very clear that the mark, and in fact, the mark of the Christian right now is those who've passed through the baptismal waters. God seals us with his Holy Spirit. When we make this profession of faith and now the mark to say, I'm a Christ follower, I'm going to do what he says, I'm going to be baptized. So this mark of the beast is an unholy equivalent. We're not exactly sure what it will look like, but the person then associates with the beast. One historian gave, uh, they said, well, and this is true, I wouldn't just baptize someone because they just wanted to be baptized. I would sit down with them, and I'm going to tell their stories in just a moment, talk about what it means to have faith in Christ, talk about the word repentance, talk about no longer living for self and living for him, and the baptism is a symbol of that inward change. In a similar way, historians would say, well, the false prophet probably will have some kind of system in the same way to make sure you're following the Antichrist. And they One historian makes a comparison with uh, Roman Emperor Trajan. At that time, when he was emperor, Christians were viewed as heretics and a threat to the government, a capital offense. Some people suspected of being Christians were brought before a governor 
His name was Pliny the Younger, or Pliny the Younger, however you pronounce it. He wrote about how he tested these Christians. Um, In order to avoid the death sentence, he required people to call upon pagan gods with prayers that he dictated to them. They also had to offer prayers and incense to Emperor Trajan's image. Finally, he ordered them to curse Christ because this was something that Pliny said, true Christians are unable to do. He also wrote this, I interrogated these as to whether they were Christians, those who confessed, I interrogated a second and third time, threatening them with punishment, those who persisted, I ordered, executed. So those, during the Great Tribulation, anyone who wants to be able to buy and sell will need to apply for the right to do so. These applicants may need to pass the screening process devised by the false prophets, and it will call for openly worshiping the image of the Antichrist and denounce Christ. Are are we hearing this in terms of what he's saying to us? In between now and then, and I thought about this, well, we use credit cards to buy and sell, and it would be, in fact, I was telling somebody the other day, do you remember the first time you actually used a credit card at the pump and didn't have to go inside and pay? Jeff mentioned a check. I don't know if you're going to ask how many people use checks anymore. And we might be one generation away from people saying, I don't want to deal with all those things, just, just give me a mark. Now, having a mark to buy and sell is different than having a mark to give allegiance to worshiping the Antichrist, Okay. So we have to be very discerning about what technologically may be happening and what is our personal submission. For me, I feel like it, this is God's um, line in the sand. Because those who profess to be Christians and then take the mark, say it doesn't matter, I want to be able to buy and sell, and follow the Antichrist really is the divider then to say, well, you really weren't a Christ follower at all. This article this week I saw online, in 1990, a man by the name of Tom Stuker bought a lifetime pass from United Airlines for $290,000. Lifetime pass means he could fly anywhere, anytime, any plane. He has since flown 23 million miles. And look at this, he calls the purchase the best investment of his life. If I were to say to you that we're selling tickets today, not to the Super Bowl, which are thousands of dollars, I couldn't believe it. Man, you know, one of those suites is like a million dollars. It was just incredible. To say that you have the absolute guarantee to go to heaven one day, would you say sign me up? Well, I'm not going to do that because it's not for sale. It's absolutely free through Jesus Christ who gave his life To pay the price for our sins, we have the ability and now the privilege to go to heaven where Jesus is preparing a place for us. Have we received that gift? And could we say, I will, it's the best investment of my life because Christ has already invested in me. He's already paid the price. And that leads us to the second point, and that is that we see God's punished settlement. He himself shall all, now this is why it's so personal. We've been talking about the angel one coming and talking about coming to Christ. Here's the gospel. Here's God the creator. Babylon has fallen, the evil system of the world. And now we're talking personally. If anyone, this is the one-on-one. And now verse 10, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Let's just pause that there just a moment. As we think about God, boy, it's even hard to think about. It's even hard for me to pull my notes out. God's wrath. This is from a commentator last name by the name of Lad. He says this, two words are used to describe God's judgment here. Wrath, which is the Greek word thumos, and anger, which is orge. There's no sharp distinction between these two words, but orge represents the kind of anger, listen to this, that rises out of a settled disposition, while thumos represents anger of a more passionate kind. In most of the New Testament, orge is the usual word to designate the divine wrath. Outside of Revelation, thumos is only used once in Romans 2. However, both words are frequently used together in the Greek Bible, and they are used here together to intensify the reality of God's wrath. 
God's wrath is not a human emotion. It is the settled reaction of his holiness to man's sinfulness and rebellion. Unless God in his wrath finally purges the world of all evil and rebellion, his kingdom cannot come. I read that intensively for the people that say, but God's a loving, merciful God. He's not going to judge. He's not going to send somebody into eternity of torment and suffering. And here we are, folks. I hear it all the time. Well, pulpits aren't preaching fire and brimstone. Here today, you're hearing fire and brimstone. It's a reality. And it's because of the wrath of God. John 3.36, He who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God rests upon him. The choice of following Christ, following the Antichrist. And it's, it's interesting, too. We read here, it says, um, where it's, which is poured out full strength. It is referring to the wine, and often the cup is given as a symbol of God's judgment. But full strength, they used to dilute the wine. We read that with the wedding feast of Cana, the wine's diluted. And they would also put spices in it to make it taste better. But here we see, if wine is... is, is Symbol of God's wrath, it is full strength. No delusion. All that God has to bring on judgment of sin, he will do for those that don't put their trust in him. One commentary, his last name is Morris, he says this, I, I, and I, this, he just says it better than I could, I'm going to read it. The Lord Jesus himself, as the Lamb of God, once drained the cup of God's indignation, enduring all the fury of an offended creator. When Jesus died on the cross, he bore the wrath of God for all of our sins. He died physically, but spiritually, and just, it's, just, it's just hard to imagine, that he then took that wrath for you and for me. For our sins. But now, his own, his own sufferings for those who deserve them. But now, they had all willfully rejected his sacrifice so that they themselves must drink the cup of God's wrath. That's the truth of Scripture. Christ came to pay the price for our sin, which is God's wrath. You know, when we talk about being saved, the penalty of our sin is God's eternal wrath. If you're here today, you're a Christ follower, you've been born again, have you rejoiced today that God has delivered you from the wrath of God? He's given us abundance, and he's given us the fruit of the Spirit, and we're to be joyful, but that penalty has been paid. Psalm 75, 8 specifically he talks about this wrath for in the hand of the lord there is a cup the wine is red it is fully mixed he pours it out surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drink drain and drink down jesus in matthew 25 call it waves of fire this this word torment it it literally means it literally means to examine but it means examine by torture torment to buffet as a wave would buffet us. If you've ever been in a strong current and get hit by a wave, well, this is eternal, and it's with fire, not with water, and just calling it waves of fire. This is the settled punishment that God said will come. Jesus talked about it, Matthew 25. Then he will say also to those on his left hand, remember he talks about the goats on the left, the sheep on the right, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He said, I never knew you. You did not minister and love as a follower of mine should do, so I didn't know you. And now you'll depart into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these were probably godly people who thought just doing the things they wanted to do was okay. Or the good deeds outweighing the bad and missing the point of the gospel that because of the love of Christ, his payment for our sin and our reception of that, he is the only way into eternal life. And if not, this punishment is settled. And then this last point where it says here, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Watched by the faithful. Now, I don't believe this is for eternity because we talk about the outer darkness, then we'll talk about that in just a moment, that Jesus said that folks will be going to. But here we see 
And, and I think this is part of when we read in Philippians that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And I don't understand the body, and there'll be a resurrected body, but I do understand this, that forever there'll be torment. Isaiah 66, 24, last verse in Isaiah. They shall go forth, look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. Their worm does not die, their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. This punishment for sin and disobedience and Faith in Antichrist versus Christ is settled. I really wouldn't plan to talk about the Super Bowl this much, but the, the article's just kind of they're all over the place today, uh, this week. And this one says, it's now a totally new world. And the article is about, did you know that Las Vegas was basically frowned upon and discouraged by the NFL for ever having any games or any Super Bowls there. Did you know that? I wonder why. What's, what's Las Vegas known as? They said that in 2003, when the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority asked to run a TV, TV commercial to run the Super Bowl, the NFL refused to air the, the ad. Why? It was the ad that says, what happens in Vegas they, they, wouldn't air, they wouldn't air that ad. Why? It, 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 uh, let's see, let me read on down here. The idea for tourists was about craving a place with relaxed rules and no judgment. And they didn't want to air that. You don't think things have changed in 20 years? The article goes on to say it's a totally new world. We have a team there now. And now the Super Bowl is here because now gambling has been legalized. You don't think the world's changing? The spirit of Las Vegas, well, there's no judgment, no rules. Let's just apply it to the whole world. Folks, that's the spirit of Antichrist. God is righteous, and he is holy, and he is just, and he will bring punishment for sin. And he will bring eternal torment for disbelief and rejection of his son Jesus. And I'm going to keep repeating it. If you've not put your faith in Christ... And you say it's not time, or you have time. You will leave here today with a spirit of rejection, and we've seen the punishment for that has been settled. And friends, please, I, you know, I don't plead much from the pulpit, but don't neglect the call of God. This is the gift of God for eternal, eternal life. And, and so the final point, it is a permanent suffering. That's verse 11, the smoke of their tor torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. That word receives. You know in John when he talks about those who have received the Lord become his children. You know that word? It's lambano in the Greek. It means to physically and taking initiative to take. That gets back to the mark. It's not just going to be slapped on someone. It's, it's a decision of the heart that those who have received that mark or received the Lord Jesus. It is it's a physical initiative of something to do, to take. Well, this permanent suffering, what will it be? Well, and this is where I talked earlier about, I believe, yes, looked upon by the Lamb and the holy angels, but there will be a removal. Look at Matthew eight twelve. The sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. And here he's referring to the centurion who just said, you don't even need to come to my house. You have all authority. And he said, I haven't seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. And then he says, the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The burning, the sulfur, the, it's, he's describing hell. Weeping, we understand. Gnashing, we understand in terms of the tremendous pain, and you've heard me say it a hundred times, and it was a sermon I listened to years ago, that it also means, back to the quarterback again, if a quarterback misses a pass and comes back to the huddle, he's gnashing his teeth. Why? Not in pain. He's in regret. I missed it. And there'll be untold numbers of people standing before God in his judgment and say, I missed it. Can you imagine having that attitude forever? That's what he's saying here. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. 
We hear the good news a lot of how God's preparing a place for us and eternity is going to be a wonderful place. Heaven's going to be a wonderful place. It's going to be forever, but hell is going to be torment forever. And you may be saying, well, I'm already safe. I'm good to go. Christ is my... But is there someone you know who said it there? Might even be a good person doing good things, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus. No better day today than today to tell them. 2 Thessalonians 1 9. These shall be punished from everlasting destruction, from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power. The very judgment of God is to remove his love and his mercy. And just the, back to that undiluted wrath that no mercy. That was even one of the definitions by John MacArthur. Just like this is judgment without mercy. And to think of how God's mercy just overwhelms. We pray about that. His mercies are new every morning. That will be gone in hell. And then it's restless. And we, we'll get to that in the latter part of Revelation when the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beasts, the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The truth of God's word. This personal submission, punishment that settled, and permanent suffering. I don't know if you bought one yet, but uh, Apple's come out with their new um, Vision Pro headset. It just If you didn't know, it's $3,500. Woo. The headline here reads, though, we're putting a label on the future. Apple conjures up the term spatial computing for launch of its new Vision Pro headset, creating this virtual reality to say this is our future, and I'm not saying it's the spirit of Antichrist, but they're sure the dynamic of doing things away from what is real, and real is sin and judgment. Oh, no, let's, go, let's just have a happy place. Let's, let's not go to a place where we have to deal with all that. Just like we said earlier, it's a total, totally new world. So what, what's the label that's going to be on our future? Is it one that will be increasing deception? I think so. It will be one with increasing acceptance of sin? I believe so, because we're hearing about God's judgment coming and personal suffering because of that. So what do we do about that? Well, number one, are we personally submitted to the Lord Jesus? Not just giving lip service and saying, I'm born again, but knowing His Holy Spirit dwells within us, making sure others know about it, and living like it. It should be a new world for us. We're new creatures. Knowing that the punishment is settled, we won't stand before the judgment seat, that the, the great right throne of judgment will be the judgment seat of Christ where he gives out his rewards. But those we know, I know everybody here knows someone that doesn't know Christ. This very truth should burden us to the very core, as I believe it burdens the Lord, who desires all to be saved. That's his heart. I've used this verse in the conclusion the last two weeks. I'm going to keep using it because this is victory. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Praise God that we read of this judgment, that we are, according to the Lamb of God, who died for our sins and His shed blood covers us now, gives us His righteousness, and we will head to heaven. But the truth still holds of God's judgment of a place of eternal Torment. Throughout history, throughout the Bible, God has repeatedly warned men about judgment for sin, given the opportunity to repent. The first angel invited sinners to turn to God. The second one warned that the worldly Babylonian system would be destroyed. Here we've seen that if people persist in their sins, even after God's many warnings, they will suffer forever with only themselves to blame. I plead this last time before I pray, let that not be you. Let's pray. Lord, all of us, as we bow our heads, have to answer the question, what is the voice of our determination? Have we put our trust in you? Have we repented of sin? Have we physically been baptized to profess that to the world as you called us to? As we enter this time of response and of baptism, Lord, I pray you'd move mightily among us. Not just for those being baptized who made that choice and we'll celebrate, but for anyone else here, Lord, who's heard the truth of Scripture and doesn't want to go into a Christless eternity. 
And for those of us that are going into a Christ-filled eternity, we don't want others to go there either. Help us to be burdened to understand this truth and loving, as that first angel, to proclaim the good news until Jesus comes again. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.